how it can help your patients in your own practice. We're really excited tonight to spend some time talking about real-life camera patients. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First, you are all muted, so we can't hear any comments or questions verbally. Please make sure to type questions into the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes to answer questions. We will do our best to get through as many as possible. Any questions we don't have time for will be addressed by email, and we also offer one-on-one -on -one webinars for practices interested in learning more. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Kim Cooch, CEO and founder of Oral Biotech and the Carry Free System. He is the world's leading authority on ATP as it relates to carried risk assessment. Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for 35 years, still practicing three days a week here in Albany, Oregon. He has a huge vision for curing dental caries, motivating him to start this company. And it continues to motivate him in the research he's leading to improve caries diagnosis and treatment. He has a lot of passion for what he does, and it's always great to hear him speak. So with that, Dr. Cooch, take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Janelle, and, and welcome, and thank you all of you for being with us tonight. Uh, my voice is a little uh, tough here tonight. I've uh, had a case of laryngitis, which I've pretty well gotten over, but uh, I also, uh, the cottonwood trees here are in full bloom in beautiful Albany, Oregon, and uh, especially today. So if I uh, lapse into a coughing fit, everybody just uh, hang on. Uh, the, the, the gang here will call 911 if necessary, but I think I can get through this and hopefully without losing my voice. So having said that, um, it's going to be an interesting evening tonight. I want to share some cases, and I want to go some, uh, through some things with you, some thoughts that I've had. But it's kind of we're, we're really at a point where I think there's a lot of different factors that are going on um, in our marketplace of, of dentistry and as it relates to Canberra. And, and I had some interesting conversations with some other thought leaders and going to share some of those things and how they might kind of relate to how we practice Canberra and how maybe you're looking at it. And if you, you know, you're an experienced practitioner with Canberra tonight, um, you know, you might change a few things in, in your own practice. And if you're new to Canberra, you know, maybe give you a different look at it. So um, might uh, throw out a few controversial statements there tonight, a little heresy. But, uh, you know, that's uh, I'm a truth teller, and I'm going to call it as I see it and, and share with you what I, what I think what's going on. Um, I have a strong passion for curing dental caries, and, and one way or another, we're going to accomplish that goal. In the past, I've, I've shared a lot with you about pattern recognition, and so as we go through cases tonight, I really want you to stop and look at the photos, look at the radiographs, look at the risk assessment form, and start to categorize these patients. Um, you know, are we dealing with, um, you know, a saliva issue? These, this is the data from the six practice multi-site uh, study that we did over a two-year span of, you know, almost 8,000 patients, 63% of people had a, a salivary issue. 55% of people, patients had a, a, a dietary issue. Um, bacteria was somewhere between, depending upon the, the practice, somewhere between 46 and 51% had a biofilm issue. Uh, certainly, we don't know at this point in time how many patients have genetic issues as it relates to, to dental caries, but I would tell you that's Certainly, that's a growing field, and, and I anticipate that we're going to learn more and more about that. You know, but at the end of the day, it's always our old friend Kaiser Sose. It's always prolonged periods of low pH that are, you know, resulting in net mineral loss in the teeth. And so as we start to look at these cases, that's really going to dictate where we go with our therapy when we start to stop and think about the therapy. So the suspects really drive the treatment strategy. So, and it, basically the risk factors drive your strategy. You're going to try and address and account for the risk factors. You know, so if they have a bacterial issue, if you identify that as one of the risk factors, they either need antimicrobial therapy if they have a high or too much biofilm, or they may also need, you know, just better home care instructions of brushing and flossing. They may need a little support um, in their behavior and, and as they approach their home care. You know, if they've got a dietary issue, you know, it really comes down to they've either got too much sugar in their diet or they're eating too frequently. So we really need to talk about limiting sweets versus limiting snacking. Salivary issues, generally we're talking about hyposalivation. Generally that is a result of um, medication-induced hyposalivation or xerostomia. 
And so, you know, most people don't have enough saliva today that we're dealing with these issues as a risk factor. And so there you just need to make sure that they understand what that means and the, the protective mechanism that saliva um, adds to this equation and they need to keep their mouth hydrated, but hydrated with water that isn't like bottled water that has a pH of 4.0. We need to really help them understand uh, the whole pH concept of, of dental caries and the fact that, you know, we need them to think about neutralizing their mouth, replacing the benefit of the saliva. You know, and if you suspect a genetic issue, you know, we just want to support them, keep them, again, as healthy as we can, help them minimize their acidic exposures, you know, those episodes of low pH, and just support wellness as much as we can with them as well. Um, you know, so the treatment issues, you know, the questions that I get, and, and these have been, you know, I'm 13, 14 years into this process, and I still get these same questions. It's like, well, where do I start? You know, how do I stage the treatment? When do I treat what? You know, how do I motivate the patient and, and how do I manage the risk? And, you know, Camber really comes down to this. You know, this is the big question mark. We're on this road, this pathway to Camber, and the real question is, you know, where do I start? You know, how do I stage this? When do I, dr when do I drill and fill? You know, those are the questions that I think most people have. And I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm going to share with you, I'm, this represents a departure for me. Um, you know, for the past 13 years, I've been a strong advocate that we needed to uh, do our risk assessment and then do the therapeutic strategies correct and manage all the risk before we did the restorative work. Now, mind you, in, in that process, in the treatment time, in the therapeutic time, I wanted to eliminate the lesions and use, you know, inner materials or maybe composite, but I, I didn't want to put a lot of expensive, definitive, restorative treatment in a mouth that I was concerned that was still at high risk and that that may um, have a, a high risk for potential breakdown. Um, and I think, you know, part of that comes from I've had enough, I've seen enough failures, I've seen enough of my own work fail in these mouths that I was ready to let's stop and address the problem first and then go back and provide the definitive, you know, restorative care. You know, and part of it is, you know, John Coyce has, I mean, his mantra is, you know, you're not the Coast Guard, you don't have to go out today. You know, we as practitioners don't have to take that risk. And the problem is, and I think we've all experienced this, is, you know, the patient, you put the crown on the tooth, you pat them on the head, the patient goes away, they come back a year later and they've now got decay, you know, secondary decay around the, the crown that's just a year old, and it's your problem, right? It's suddenly it's your crown has decay, your crown needs to be redone, and they expect us to do that for free. And so, you know, suddenly we're taking all the risk and taking all the, all the, all the heat. And, you know, I was at a point in my career, you know, years ago that I, I was done doing that. And, you know, patients still expect that out of us. And I know that I'm just like you are. You know, that, you know, I do that for patients, right? We all bend over and we all try and satisfy the patient and make the customer happy and what have you. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I want the patient to take the risk. I don't want to carry that risk anymore on my shoulders. I'm tired of being the Coast Guard. And so in my own practice, um, back in 2001, it's like I stopped taking the risk. It's like, no, it's not going to be my problem. You're going to understand the risk before we're going to manage and deal with those risks. And then, I'll, and then once I'm satisfied that we've reduced your risk or we're managing your risk for decay, then I'm willing to put these expensive restorations on there because I'm not going to replace them for free. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm, it's not my responsibility. But I grant you, I hadn't been diagnosing the risk and I hadn't been managing from the patient. You know, and so that's kind of how we've all been approaching and presenting Canberra for the last, you know, 13 or 14 years. And the challenge with that is, um, here's, here's the challenge, and, I, and I'm sensitive to this. You've got a young dentist, and I don't care if this young dentist is either in, um, in private practice, their own practice, maybe they purchased a practice, or they're in corporate dentistry, it doesn't matter. But the young dentist is sitting there with a, a high caries risk patient. The patient needs four crowns. The patient is ready to have the four crowns done and willing to pay for them, and this dentist has an opening in their schedule tomorrow. And they may have three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars worth of student loan debt breathing down their neck. And you know, they've thought of, okay, we're gonna put those four crowns off for a year maybe, or six months, or three months even, while we manage the risk and we go through this, that's not happening. 
and it's not happening. And you know, as long as we continue to, I think, head down this path with the concept you've got to do all of this on the front end, you know, it, it's not going to be incorporated into practices. That's just not reality for us. I mean, there are a lot of practices out there right at the moment that have taken a, a serious hit from the economy in the last five years. Um, you know, and I have to tell you, I have the luxury, I'm 35 years into practice and working part time, I have the luxury to be able to, you know, have it my way in my practice and, and not be the Coast Guard whenever I don't feel like it. But I also remember the days 35 years ago when I started my own practice from scratch and I needed, I needed every restorative treatment procedure that came through the door. I'm not talking about I needed every patient. I needed every procedure that came through that door. And I needed it every day. And I remember those days. And I, I you know, literally, I, I would not have been able to practice the way I do today in those days. I wouldn't have made it through the first six months. I, I wouldn't have been able to pay my bank loans. So um, I think it's nice for us to look at an ideal treatment strategy at the same point in time the, re the reality reflects back to me 13 years into this is one of the challenges that dentists are facing is the financial challenges and if you've got opening your schedule tomorrow and I've got a high-risk patient sitting here I need to figure out how to, how, to, how to do the restorative work and make this work you know so what I'm proposing tonight and I think you're going to see other thought leaders um, in, you know, in Canberra, also start to look at this in other ways as well. Is let's look about, let's look at doing our risk assessment. Maybe starting to talk about the behavioral management and the and the therapy, but also let's get in and do the restorative and let's figure out how to manage the risk on the other side. We're talking about protecting our restorations. You know, I, I threw this out to my team today. Preventive dentistry is dead. And I know that's a shocking statement. I have to tell you, I've been in this 35 years. Preventive dentistry is dead. It's dead on arrival. You know, everything that we've done and we've been doing in, in, the, in the name of, under the tent of preventive dentistry is not working. The K rates are going up. We're in the number one disease now in mankind worldwide in every country in, all, in literally every age bracket. Everything that we've done in the United States under the, under the, the, the tent of, preventive dentistry is not working. And if we keep going at it, doing the same thing that we've always been doing, it's going to continue to get worse. The decay rate, the incidence of dental caries is worse today than I when I started this mission 13, 14 years ago. And I thought we'd have cured this disease by now. So we've got to change our approach. And instead of worrying about preventing things, we need to figure out how to protect things. I mean, the reality is, uh, we're dealing with patients that are taking 15 medications a day. We're dealing with a, a younger population that has a different diet, and there is more sugar in their diet. And you know what? I can't maybe change the behavior of the diet of everybody in the United States. And so what I need to figure out is how do I identify that, manage that risk, and help that patient? How do I protect my restoration so I don't end up being the Coast Guard? And so what I want to talk about tonight is, maybe a departure from my kind of where I was coming from to start to think about, okay, how do we work that restorative care in at the same point in time, make sure the patient assumes the risk for it while we're managing that risk after the care and helping protect those restorations. So I'm, instead of thinking about prevention, I'm thinking about protection now and protective dentistry rather than preventive. Uh, we've got this problem. Let's figure out how to solve it. And we need to you know, solve this problem with different thinking than we've had in the last 13 years. So I'm open-minded and I'm ready to make some changes. So <clears throat> having said that, if you've seen many of my lectures or spent much time with me at all, you've seen this patient. And I'm not talking about this patient tonight. This is not a patient that I would hang 28 crowns on and then figure out how I was going to help her manage the risk on the other side, how I was going to protect my crowns. This is not the patient I'm talking about. The patient I'm talking about tonight is the person who comes in, they're high risk. They need three or four restorations, and whether those are fillings or crowns. But I'm not talking about the, this you know, extreme case. I'm talking about the case that I think that we can successfully manage. The most important part of this process for us is going to be communication. In that process, if you want to start the restorative early, we need to make sure that the patient understands there's risk that these restorations may fail if we don't manage the risk and protect the restorations. And as long as we communicate that, 
head and put that back on the shoulders of the patient, you know what, I'm okay with that because I, I've, I've seen successful cases like that in my own practice, patients that didn't want to wait. They wanted to get started and they were motivated and I was okay and they turned out successful. So as we've talked about behavioral management and wellness coaching, um, you know, I came, you know, we developed these five steps and the five different sets of questions that we're going to change kind of the language that we, that we use with patients. And tonight, really, what I want to talk about is not, you know, the first couple of questions here, seeing the person as a whole, a person with a disease, or, you know, telling the patient, you know, this is what I found or what I found is, trying to be non-judgmental. What I really want to talk about tonight is this is the part where the rubber hits the pavement now. Now what do we do? I've, I found out that you are high risk for dental caries. I found five teeth that have decay and we need to do restorative care for. I also found three risk factors that are causing, that I believe are contributing or causing your disease. You know, you got to enroll the patient. So tonight we're thinking about what do you want to focus on? You know, what do you want to do? And, and how is that going to benefit you if you if you make that change? I want to encourage the patient and let them know that I know you can do that. You know, I, I totally see you being able to accomplish that. And the last part is, you know, the next step is, you know, how would you solve this? What is the next best first step? Where do we start? What do you want to do first? And so, you know, if we really take that whole model um, before where we were doing the assessment and then the therapy and then the restoration, well, if the patient, you know, if we really go to a, a coaching model and we have those you know, those open lines of communication with the patient and where they want to start is with the restorative care. You know what, I'm, I'm more open-minded from a coaching standpoint of saying, okay, I'll let you dictate that. Let's go there, but with a clear understanding of what the risks are and what other kind of changes you're going to need to make to protect those restorations and manage your risks on the other side of that equation. You know, and, and one of the things that we talked about last month as we looked at ATP was really using the ATP, if they have high biofilm, this is a great motivational tool. You know, the Diagnodent is a great lesion identifier. And, I, you know, the Diagnodent isn't really, for me, as much in my practice as it is, as, as much as it is for the patient. It's like the best benefit that I find from Diagnodent, yeah, it tells me whether or not I'm looking in those pits and fissures and, you know, whether I've got a high score or a lower score. The question is then when do you decide to, to you know, what do you do with that? data and then when do you decide to treat them because they might have a high score and it's something you may ignore and they may have a low score and it may be something that you decide to treat uh, if that's a 12 year old kid with you know lots of plaque on their teeth and you're not sure when you're going to see them again so the data point itself doesn't matter as much as the fact that they understand that there's something going on here and they see the light and the buzzer and it's like ooh, we have a problem and so you know the the carry screen meter can be, can be used the same way to help motivate patients to you know, start getting getting their care done, whether that involves therapy and or restorative care. You know, and how do you manage risk? You know, like how do we protect the teeth and the restorations after we do that? And I tell you, this is my go-to right here. You know, if they have a high biofilm issue, you know, I'm going to use the treatment rinse. But I tell you, other than that, if I can get at the end of the day, if I can get the patient to use this twice a day. Um, this is my, and, and maybe even, you know, for those patients that are severe, like in a tray at night, but this is my go-to product. This material works. If I can get a patient out of this, I know I can be successful, and I know that we've managed, helped manage their risk, reduce it as much as I'm capable of. So, I mean, you know, that's a simple thing. So we really need to start talking about how do we manage it on the other side. Um, this was just published in, in, the, in JADA this month, and I thought it was really interesting. This is a huge cohort. This is from the Veterans Administration. <laughs> I know the VA has a lot of bad issues going on right at the moment, but this is a really a positive study that was done. It looked at over 225,000 veterans um, on average per year over a span of about six years. And they looked at how many restorations they were receiving and what kind of issues that they were having before there was um, a fluoride performance measure added to their protocol and once that they had this performance measure for making sure that these adults, these veterans got fluoride in their equation, it reduced the risk of future restorations. Now, like I, I said earlier, you know, what we've been doing isn't working. Fluoride does help, but it isn't the 
it's not the complete answer here. We wouldn't even be sitting here having this conversation tonight. But it does work. And fluoride, fluoride is something that, you know, again, but putting that performance measure in, it, here's a huge study just published that says we can help manage risk on the other side and reduce the number of, of um, necessary restorations after, after, after treating and seeing these patients. So uh, I think that really gives us some encouragement. Now, when we finished up with the ACP, um, last month in the, in the webinar, we finished with this patient, and I want to pick this case up and start with this one tonight. So again, I want you to think usual suspects. You're looking at this photograph. Obviously, I think we can all agree right out of the gate, this person is high risk for dental caries. I mean, I, you know, there shouldn't be anybody in, in doubt on that. 48-year-old female patient, she got active decay, um, you know, does she have enough saliva? Does she have a lot of plaque on her teeth? These are the kind of questions. So I mean, I'm just looking at looking at the mouth and what do we see going on in there? Because that's going to start to be part of my um, diagnosis. Uh, she has a dental fear, a dental fear scale. She reports about a number five on a on a scale of one to ten. Um, her priorities: she wants to replace the missing teeth and be able to eat and smile again. She doesn't like her crooked front tooth, and she wants to know what her options are to accomplish that. Um, and I think I shared with you, you know, the whole concept of she and I weren't communicating on which tooth, the crooked front tooth, and what that meant. She's had uh, thyroid disease. She takes Synthroid. Her blood pressure was within the normal range. Her, so was her pulse. Uh, this is her caries risk assessment form. And when you get onto the form here, the first thing that jumps out at you is um, yes, 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 yes. She has all the disease indicators. Uh, she had a low, low biofilm score like 658. But I go back up here and the thing that, that really stands out to me is she's drinking iced tea with sugar. Um, you know, and she takes Synthroid. That's not contributing to any xerostomia issue. But she, she does this uh, literally sits on iced tea with sugar all day long. And, you know, so the question is, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. It's not, what are you drinking? Why are you drinking that? What are you putting in it? It's more, of, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And she explained that to me. and and. I helped explain to her the process of dental caries, and she said, do you think this is causing my problem? I go, yeah, I definitely definitely think this is a huge contributing factor for you. And you, it's not that you have biofilm buildup on your teeth. It's like this appears to be a dietary issue more than anything else. How would you go about, how would you change that? And then she sat and laid out a plan for that. When we look at her radiographs, obviously I had to extract some rib tips. Um, and, you know, her risk assessment period was low, caries extreme. Um, occlusion low, aesthetics high. She shows all of her teeth when she smiles. Uh, low medical risk, and yeah, you know, I put moderate restorative risk just based on the fact that you know she's had such a history of, of decay. Um, and so let's really go down to like, what do you want to focus on? What do you want? How will that benefit you? And and um, she laid that out. And so I started by restoring it all hinged on her one front tooth that was crooked in the in the big cavity. And so I, I repaired, I just put a composite restoration in there. She was looking at an upper denture. That's what she was thinking she wanted. And when I got her to agree to let me restore the one tooth and then let's see what it looks like. And if you are happy with that, can we maybe try and look at a plan to figure out how to save the rest of your teeth? And she said, yeah, I'm, I, let's, let's do that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you straighten my one tooth and we'll see what it looks like. And then I'll decide. Um, and so that's where, you know, that's how she wanted to start. And in terms of the iced tea, she went to straight plain iced tea with no sugar. And I mean, she started doing that immediately. And, and now she's, her plan is to switch over to water, have one or two iced teas a day and, and drink water the rest of the day, tap water, by the way. So here she is in, you know, stage one treatment. I extracted the root tips. Um, I just put a composite restoration there in tooth number nine. Turned out that wasn't the one that was bothering her. It was the incisal edge of number eight that was crooked that was con most concerning to her. So, you know, we did a little enamelplasty there. We straightened that tooth. You know, so we got her teeth to the point where she's like, yeah, I could be happy enough with a smile like that. I I'm interested in saving the rest of my teeth. We made her just an interim flipper partial there to, to replace those teeth so she has something to chew with. And, you know, and then we're going to start, you know, doing the rest of her restorations. Now, this is a patient who's making those changes. This is somebody that I would say, in my own practice, I'm going to go ahead and restore her now and manage the risk on the other side and protect my restorations. I hope that makes sense to everybody and everybody kind of follow that. 
with me. We went through the risk assessment, identified that, went through the coaching, and it just becomes part of the process. But you don't have to delay treatment on a patient like that. This patient is 50 year, 58 years old. She's a, a female patient, again. Um, and you look in the mouth, and it's kind of like, well, what do you see here? You know, does she have saliva? Um, do you see a lot of plaque buildup on her teeth? Do you see cavities in her teeth? You know, what kind of things do you see? And again, this is, you know, this is where we start. Her dental fear scale was low, too. She had no concerns about, you know, coming to dentist. She's had a lot of dentistry done. You know, and, and her priors were, I just want to keep my teeth looking nice. I don't want to lose any teeth, and I don't want any more cavities. So we look at, you know, her medical history. She had a history of an accident. She uh, developed idiopathic hives. She takes Zizal daily, which is um, an antihistamine, and it, it extremely dries your mouth out. Um, now her mouth, we'll go back to the photograph real quick. Well, she doesn't have a saliva bubbling anywhere. I mean, she's got a fairly dry mouth. I, I've seen a lot worse, but certainly she has a dry mouth. Um, so she's taking that. When we look at then her carriage risk assessment form, um, she doesn't have any cavities, and she really doesn't have any disease indicators, but she's got a high biofilm score. You know, so does she need anything? Well, she's kind of doing okay right at the moment as she is, but certainly they're having a, a high biofilm score. She's got a very active biofilm in there. Uh, some of it's just due to the fact that there's what, what little biofilm she has on her teeth is particularly acidogenic, acid uric, because uh, she doesn't have the protective alkaline saliva as, as much as a normal healthy person. And, you know, so I look at her restorations. You know, she's got some margins that aren't perfect, but I don't see any decay, um, quite, a, quite a history of, of restorative care. But certainly she has some risk around a lot of restorations there. So, you know, this is something I discussed with the patient. And, um, again, a risk assessment or perio was low. Carries was moderate to high. Um, and you could call that either mod moderate or high. I'd, I'd agree with either of those. I'd probably be more inclined to lean to moderate because she doesn't have any lesions currently. Um, low risk on occlusion. Moderate, she's normal on her aesthetic display. Uh, medical risk is low. Restorative list risk is is low to moderate. You know, I mean, most of those restorations have been in there quite a while, it seems like, and she's doing pretty well. But there is some risk for her because of her high biofilm score going forward and the fact that she doesn't have enough saliva. So, again, you know, the question becomes, what would you like to focus on? Um, and in this case, this patient said, I want to be proactive. I want to just make sure that I you know, prevent, you know, I don't want any more cavities. So it's like whatever I can do to help myself, you know, please let me know. So that's when we talked about this patient. So, you know, I put her on, this is the patient that I actually put on the, the treatment rinse, put her on a kit. We went for three months. Um, her ATP score came down pretty significantly, and now I've just switched her over to the CTX4 gel, and she's using that twice a day in, instead of Denifers. So, you know, this isn't a patient I did any restorative care on, but it's somebody that was one of those patients that had a high biofilm or score, and certainly, you know, it puts them at risk. And so, you know, and it's really up to the patient. When I when I ask these kind of questions, it's not, you know, it's like, what would you want to do? You know, do you want to do anything at all? Is as long as you understand the risk, right? That your increased risk of having decay around one of the margins on your crowns. And if you're okay just leaving things as they are and hoping that you don't get a cavity there, hey, I'm okay with that. But if you want to do something about that, you know, I have, we have options and let's talk about it. I hope that case made sense to everybody. Um, this is a 26-year-old female patient. Again, you know, look in the mouth. Uh, you know, what do you see? Um, you know, does she have saliva? Those are the first things that I start to look at. Does she have plaque buildup on her teeth, and does she have saliva? You know, so I'm starting to look at those two suspects, you know, right out of the gate here. And one, one of the things that we see here is we see quite a bit of um, decalcified white spot lesions. We see what may appear to be even some active lesions in the enamel on smooth surfaces here in the front of the mouth. Um, now, this patient circled 10 three times on her dental fear scale. So, uh, I, and I have to tell you, I've actually never seen that before. 
Um, I've seen it circled once, but I've never, I mean, she circled it three distinct individual times on the dental fear scale. And her priority was, I would like to have my broken teeth fixed. Um, so I, one of the things that, um, that John Coyce teaches is, you know, if somebody circles a 9, or certainly if they circle a 10 on the dental fear scale, this is not somebody you want to treat. Um, you know, these are patients that have, you know, pretty strong anxiety in the dental environment, and depending upon, you, you know, what you enjoy doing, that might be something that you would want to treat, but uh, certainly that's a huge red flag in terms of risk, um, follow through, or am I going to see the patient again? You know, I might get started into the therapy, and then you know the patient down, you know doesn't come back or or whatever. Um, this patient is being treated for depression, taking Prozac on a daily basis, um, a young person, um, pulse and and blood pressure are within certainly within normal range. And you know, here's the carries risk assessment, um, and you start to go down the list, and a couple of things that you know that I see immediately my eyes go to. Number one is the Gatorade and the Powerade all day long. Uh, you know, the number one ingredient in Gatorade is sucrose. So, um, and I haven't looked up, I couldn't tell you what the number one ingredient ingredient is Powerade is, but I'm sure there's sugar in it. Um, I, I would need to look and verify that. But certainly the Gatorade is a, is a huge red flag for me. Um, and then I look at, you know, the biofilm scores. It, she pegged the meter, 9999. Um, has you know active white spot lesions, um, new and active white spot lesions. I don't know why that's actually um, circled no, um, but everything else is there. She's got it all. She you know comes out as a, a high extreme risk patient for dental caries, and then you look in the mouth. Now it didn't look this bad when you peered in the front, right? And so it's like you know we always get. Um, I think we look at the front teeth and kind of envision a healthy, you know, or a healthier mouth. You know, there's a lot of decay going on here. There's teeth that need to, you know, first thing that need to be done are extractions of some of these second molars. Um, you know, trying to, you know, trying to get our fingers in the dike here to save the first molars and, you know, so and figure out what to do with these premolars. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, this patient's got some severe decay issues going on right at the moment, and remember. She's 26 years old. This person left without any kind of good coaching, direction, therapy, and, and restorative care is, is going to be in dentures by age 45, if not by age 35. So risk assessment, her peri perinatal risk is low. Carries risk is high or extreme. Occlusion risk is low. Aesthetic, she's moderate. She's in the center of the bell curve there. Medical risk is fairly low. Um, you know, the, the medication certainly uh, for me, she's a high restorative risk, and and the reason I, I categor, categorize her as high, number one is that she circled, you know, her dental fear scale at number ten, and she circled it three times. That that's a huge red flag for me. So my restorative risk is, you know, I may if she decides to do all the treatment, will I ever see her again? You know, well, the next time I see her be like five years, four years down the road, and now all the restorations are are failed, and we're taking more root tips out, and or maybe that might even be in a year or two. So that's one of the concerns that I have with a patient like that. And again, you know, I put this all back onto the patient. You know, where do you want to start? What do you want to focus on? You know, how do you want to accomplish this? And you know, where what, what's the first step? And you know, she agreed the first step would be to take. She wanted to have those broken teeth extracted to start with. That was going to be the first step. And so, <clears throat> you know, here she is in a before, and here she is. She canceled uh, stage one. We had the appointment set up. We had everything ready to go, and she no showed, or she actually called and canceled, and has not rescheduled. Hasn't returned calls. So. You know, I, that's going to happen. I'm, I'm sure you see patients like this in your practice, but, I, you know, I, I can't help everybody. I can only offer what I can do for people, and, and, and certainly she understood what was going on. But and we can do our best to try and manage their fear in the dental practice, and I, quite, I think that, you know, we, we're quite 
quite good at that in our practice. But um, but again, you know, laterally, you know, she just pulled the plug on the entire operation, decided to do nothing for now. Um, so, you know, that happens, and those patients, those kind of patients happen. Here's another patient that's 58 years old. I, I thought it'd be kind of interesting. To, I mean, I have these things happen to me, so I, you know, show you some of the successes and some of the failures as well here. Um, this is a 58-year-old patient, a female again. Um, you kind of look in the mouth, and you're looking to see what you see. Do you see a lot of plaque buildup on the teeth? I see a lot of recession. Um, Does she have saliva? She appears to have some saliva. Um, dental fear scale, three. Um, her priorities are she wants to just keep her teeth. Um, she has no disease, is not taking any medications. Blood pressure, her pulse was a little fast. I think she was a little anxious, more, more so than a three on the scale. But, um, but her blood pressure was fine. She's 58 years old. You know, you still let's look at her risk assessment form. You know, she's like, yes, 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 I would love to have a test today, and I'd like to talk about it, and I'd be happy to modify my diet, which I think we all understand is harder, is easier said than done. Um, she notices plaque buildup on her teeth. I didn't see a lot of plaque building up on her teeth. She does snack between meals. Um, she has had a cavity in the last three years. She did have a high uh, ATP score. You know, so here was somebody that, you know, we had all of these things going on. Uh, she doesn't have any decay at present. Let's go look at her radiographs. Um, looks like she had orthodontic care. She's got you know shortening of the root. She's had a long history of decay. She's got a handful of root canals. A lot of teeth have uh, full cusp coverage restorations. Um, you know she's had a lot of dental decay in the past. She has a little bit of bone loss, so her burial risk is is moderate. Uh, her carriage risk is moderate to high. She doesn't have any decay. The only thing that she had was a high biofilm score, uh, and she'd had a cavity in the last three years. Uh, her occlusal risk was low. There are some people may want to argue that. I'm looking for wear on the teeth, not necessarily just uh, abstractive areas. Um, aesthetics, again, she's in the center of the bell curve in terms of her smile and display of her teeth. Low risk from a medical standpoint, and low risk from low to moderate risk, moderate risk because of her high ATP score. And so again, you know, going through our coaching conversation with the patient, you know, this is what I found. Um, what would you like to focus on? You know, what do you want? Um, and here's a patient who said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just happy. I haven't had a cavity, you know, one cavity in the last three years. I'm kind of happy just the way things are, and I'm just going to let things go. Um, you know, so here's a patient who declined doing anything, right? She didn't want to worry about the biofilm score. And, and as long as she understood the risk, that, that puts you at increased risk of getting a, decay, a cavity again, maybe decay in her crown that you've got or another restoration that you've got or decay on all these exposed root surfaces. But if you're willing to live with the risk and you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. Because now we've discussed it. When you come back in, you have a cavity in her crown, it's not my fault. And, you know, you accepted that risk. Now, this is a patient, however, I did get to go ahead and um, use the CTX4 gel 5000. We didn't, we didn't treat the biofilm score. We didn't go to the treatment rinse. She didn't want to do any of that. She just, I did, you know, um, in our coaching conversation, get her to agree to, to switch and start using the CTX4 gel, which, again, I'm thinking protection. I'm just looking at protecting those areas, all those restorative margins. I'm, I'm looking at protecting. And here is a 21-year-old male patient. Um, so you look into the mouth, I see saliva. I see a little plaque buildup, not a lot, but I see a lot of white spot lesions. I see active decay on smooth surfaces. You know, that's really concerning to me. You know, so you've got somebody here who's got, you know, high risk for decay looking in their mouth. I don't know what his diet looks like yet, but a lot of, a lot of lesions here. So um, again, dental fear scale three. Uh, his priorities, he wants to get his cavities fixed. I don't like the brown spots on my teeth. So for him, it was more of a, a, an aesthetic concern. I don't like, you know, he's 21 years old, and I smile, and I have brown spots, and he's single. I think we can all kind of relate to the fact that you wouldn't want to be 21 and have brown spots on your teeth when you're in the dating market at that age. Um, diseases, 
He has asthma, ADHD, and he's taking albuterol and Ritalin and antihistamines. So I want to go back to his photos here for just a second. Um, so he's, you know, he, a 21-year-old, typically you'd see a lot of saliva pooling or bubbling, and even in the front of the mouth there below the anterior incisors, you know, you don't see a lot of salivary activity. His tissue doesn't appear to be dry, but on the other hand, you don't see bubbles of saliva just a little bit on the on the back on his, you know, second molar there on, on his right side. Um, you know, so he's got a little hypo-salivation issue going on. Uh, I think there's probably more, you know, I'm thinking, suspecting there's probably more than just that. Um, but in, in here's somebody that you look at his score, he's got a high score. He's, you know, got a 9999 again, he pegged the meter. He's got a lot going on in there. He's taking those three medications, which all contribute to hypo-salivation. Um, and he, I'd self-identified that, you know, I suffer from a dry mouth, you know, at different times during the day. Like, my, my mouth feels dry to me. And I was really, you know, I didn't really come up with any dietary issues for him. Uh, I think there's some home care issues going on here, I, you know, as a 21-year-old kid that we can work on. Um, but I think he's certainly got this big risk on his shoulders because of the medications. And, and I'm obviously not taking him off his medications. So we need to figure out how to you know, balance, you know, the Featherstone model, the carries balance, and really, I, I really want to talk about how do we protect and manage that risk, you know, for this for this patient on the other side. So you look in the mouth and you see, uh, you know, a couple of significant lesions there, uh, a couple of interproximal lesions, he's already lost his second molars, um, you know, so he's had some decay issues going on for a long time. Uh, there could be more than just meets the eye, you know, in terms of the, the dietary conversation, but that's what I got out of the patient. His uh, perio risk is low, um, caries risk high or extreme, occlusal risk low, aesthetic risk is, again, in this kind of average. Um, medical risk is low for treating the patient. The restorative risk is high, just strictly because we've got a patient, again, that has um, hyposalivation. He's not going to probably go off any of those medications anytime soon. So you know you're going to have a drier mouth and you're going to have those issues to contend with. So again, as we go through the coaching conversation here, you know, what what do you want to focus on? You know, how is that going to benefit you? Um, you know, I see you being able to do that and, and how would you solve it? Where would you start? What's, what's your first step here? Um, and so here's a patient that, again, I, I um, he hasn't scheduled yet for his first appointment, but I, I'm looking forward to kind of going through this case with this young um, college student to, you know, get to the bottom of this and help him manage this as, as well as we can. And I'm going to leave you, this is going to be my last patient tonight to, to share with you, my last case. We may actually, this may be a record, we may actually get done early for the first time ever. Um, maybe not. Um, and this patient came to me in 2009, and he was 43 years old at the time, and presented to me and was worried about his teeth. Now, I mean, we're looking in his mouth, and do you know? Again, I'm thinking usual suspects here. I'm looking: does he have plaque buildup on his teeth? Does he have saliva? Do I see? frank cavitations. I mean, those are the first three things that I'm looking for when I look in the mouth. You know, so what do I see going on here? Well, I see a little, little buildup of the plaque. I don't see any saliva. The guy's 43 years old, and it's like, yeah, there, that tissue might be wet down <laughs> on the back on his lower left, but I mean, in the front here, his tissue's even just dry. I've retracted his lips, and, and things are dry, dry. So that's an issue. I see a lot of decay. Uh, the guy's 43 years old, uh, you know. This is a this is an extreme an extreme caries risk case, right? And let and let me back up here for just a second. As we talked about earlier tonight, I said you know I'm making a departure from being so black and white about doing the therapy first and doing the definitive restorative care last or second. Um, I'm looking at cases now of is there an option for us to motivate this patient and start the restorative care right away and then manage the risk or protect our, our restorations and their teeth after the restorative care on the other side of that of that care. Um, 
this is not a case even today that I would that I would do that with. This is a case again. I would really want to um, manage the risk up front, do a lot, the interim kind of restorations, stage the treatment, and spread this out over a year or two. I mean, this is major restorative care. And the last thing that I want to do is put about forty thousand dollars worth of restorations in this guy's mouth, and uh, two years later, a year later, two years later, five years later, have half of them um, have recurrent decay around them and have issues. And I, I, I'm not signing up for that job. I mean, I, I'm I'm not the Coast Guard, and I'm not doing that. So I don't think this is the patient that I want to make a change on. And hopefully that you under, can appreciate or understand, you know kind of my shift in philosophy, but also can appreciate this is still the kind of case where I would recommend that everybody just step back. You're talking about a lot of money, and I want to make sure that it's going to work. If we're going to invest that kind of time and money, I don't want to have a failure one year down the road or two years down the road. Um, I look, you know, saying that tonight, it, it uh, my oldest son Carson is a dentist, and he graduated in 2005, and uh, I spent four years trying to um, drive Kerry's risk assessment into his dental brain. And you know, I thought I'd made pretty good progress, and I thought he got the whole concept. And it was the first year that he was in practice. Um, he got the opportunity to see a patient that the year before she was a young woman. The year before. Um, she had had 20 da Vinci veneers placed in her mouth by a dentist. And so this is one year out, and she had 22 lesions around those 20 da Vinci veneers. And Carson called me up in the middle of the afternoon, <laughs> called me away from a patient. He goes, Dad, I get it. I want you to know I get it. And I'm like, great. You know, what are you, what are you talking about? And he said, Dad, he, goes, I, he shares his case with me, and he says, I get it. Restorative treatment is not the treatment for dental caries because finally he had to see that case. And then it was like, oh, I get it. It's like this isn't the treatment for this disease. This woman still has this disease, and now it's destroying all these expensive restorations that were put on her mouth. And, you know, somewhere we, we dropped the ball. We didn't figure out what was causing her disease. We didn't address that. And so for a patient like this, we really want to go through it or take our time and and go through this. So let's. And some of you may have seen this case before. He's he's one of my favorite patients. This was a life changing experience for him, and I think, and for me as well. Um, his priorities that he wanted to have a better smile. He's a teacher, a professor, and he got to the point he was so embarrassed by his teeth that he was literally it was causing him problems to stand up in front of his classroom and lecture because he didn't want this, his students staring at his teeth. And you know, it was just affecting his job. It was affecting his livelihood, it was affecting his life. And I mean, he was holding his hand over his mouth, you know, trying to lecture, and he was just really embarrassed by what his teeth looked like. And I looked at him, and, you know, here's his history. You know, he had some complications here that weren't his fault. In 1989, he had a history of a head trauma from uh, an automobile accident. He's lucky to be alive. He has a scar that runs from ear to ear. He had daily migraines that were debilitating, and he was on Demerol. He was taking Demerol daily to treat the pain and the migraines. And so his serostomia is coming from the Demerol. And I mean, he's had, you know, he's had some challenges in his life that a lot of the rest of us haven't had. You know, otherwise he was relatively healthy. You look at his pulse and his, and his blood pressure. He was highly motivated to get something done. And, you know, you know, again, so the things that stand out for you on the risk assessment form here are the medications. Um, he feels like he has a dry mouth, and he notices plaque buildup on his teeth. Then you go right on down. He's got all the disease indicators. He pegged the meter on the score. And, you know, so now we're looking at this. Here's his radiographs. <clears throat> now, when he first came to me, and I took full sets of photographs, intro photographs, intro radiographs, study models, the works, and went to have a consultation with him, and I'm headed to a denture. I mean, I'm thinking maxillary denture and mandibular partial. I'm going to try and save those anterior teeth. Um, you know, there's you know seven or eight teeth that I'm going to try and save. Maybe I can save that molar, you know, number 18. And I, I'm headed to a maxillary denture and a, and a mandibular partial denture. And he immediately says, no, I don't want to lose my teeth. Well, I'm looking at 
you know, I'm looking at maxillary teeth, and I'm thinking, there's some huge lesions on those teeth. They are seriously biomechanically compromised. You may need root canal therapy on several of them, and it's like, boy, with the history of everything that we got going on here, I am not comfortable sitting down and putting crowns and, and doing all that on your teeth. I'm not, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. And so as we work through the process, the consult and the process, um, he left. And uh, I didn't see him for a year. And he came back in, and I almost didn't recognize him. He came back in, and he had gone off to Demerol. Uh, when he understood that the Demerol was causing the disease, <laughs> or contributing to the dry mouth that was, you know, certainly one of the strongest risk factors for him in terms of the, the decay and the condition of his teeth, he decided to quit taking Demerol. He'd been taking it for over 20 years, and the interesting thing that happened was um, he unilaterally just decided to do this and went and did it. Um, he discovered that he didn't have migraines anymore. In fact, he only had one migraine in the, in the previous six months, and he was able to manage it one day with Advil. So I've been taking this medication for 20 years that, that maybe wasn't necessary. So in the meantime, he probably lost 40 or 50 pounds. Um, he was running. He was juicing. Uh, I mean, he got on a health kick, and he decided, I'm going to get as healthy as I can be. And he came back in and, and wanted to see me again. So I walked in, and I looked at him, and it was like, wow, uh, what's happening in your life? And he explained all the things, all the changes that were going on. And I'd come back in to talk about the denture and the mandibular parcel, and he came back and said, here's what I've done. Now, you told me that you would stage this treatment, and you'd be willing to save my teeth as long as I put in, you know, I did my part, and we staged this out, and I was decay-free for a year. And, that, and that's what I told him. And I said, so that was the deal I made with you, you know, the last time I saw you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. So, you know, we go to his risk assessment. Uh, perio low, caries extreme, pollution low, aesthetic moderate, medical, and restorative risk, certainly in my mind, is, is high, if not extreme for this patient. You know, so going through that conversation with him, this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to save his teeth. He wanted to take the chance. And so um, we staged it. I put in primarily glass ionomer. Um, so here he is at the at before, and here he is at the end of stage one. And this probably took us about six months to accomplish, but he's got a couple of flippers. I did crown one tooth that I really just didn't figure out how else I could restore it. That was the tooth number 27. Um, I put glass ionomers uh, in all of those huge lesions. That's all we did. And I said, you know, here, we're going to put you on all this antimicrobial therapy. Uh, you need to bring your score under 1,500, and you need to remain decay-free for a year before I, before I think that you should do anything else. And so literally one year to the day, uh, which shouldn't surprise you about a patient motivator like this, he came back into the practice, and his score, his ATP score was under 1,000. Um, and he had no more decay. He didn't have any symptoms out of the teeth that we treated with ARM. Or I'm sorry, with the glass ionomer. So um, here he is today. And we're going to go back and we did an implant, we did some bridges, we did, you know, more implants on the lower. Um, you know, so here he is, he chose shade B1. Um, we restored his mouth and we're going to go back yet and now do veneers on those uh, mandibular incisors um, to restore them. But this has been, he's decay-free now, three years running. And this was a life-changing event for him. And uh, yeah. so here's something that is possible. Canberra can allow you to do, and in this case, it ended up being over forty thousand dollars. And then, here's just a, you know, a professor. But when he understood what it was going to take to do, you know, to do this, you know, he made that decision to come back and, and do that. And I would tell you that he's he's been a, um, an inspirational patient to me, just because of the fact that you know, not every patient is going to take on a challenge like that and make those behavioral changes. But you know, when you see somebody that's able to lose weight and do those and change their lifestyle. Um, then I'm encouraged that this person can make behavioral changes as, as you know, if necessary, if it's something that they really want done. He uh, he stopped by the office one day out of the blue, and he had been to the Oregon Coast crabbing, and he brought back a picture that he wanted to show me. And I have to tell you, he had the Godzilla of 
Dungeness crabs. This thing was, I've never seen a Dungeness crab that big. So in this photo, he's holding this gigantic crab. And I'm like, oh my God, that is like the biggest Dungeness crab I think I've ever seen in my life. I mean, this could be like a world record. This thing looks like Godzilla. And he goes, no, 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 not the crab. It's my smile. And he wanted to show me that was the first picture that he had had taken in 20 years that you could see his teeth when he smiled. So this was a, a very impactful, life-changing experience for him. And I came to understand that, you know, along with him as I went through the experience with him as well. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to go through here tonight with you. Um, I know that we're going to have some questions, but I just wanted to share with you the concept of looking at patients, thinking about maybe not necessarily doing the therapy first on everybody, but let's figure out how to motivate these patients. Let's get them into our schedule. Let's start treating them. And but let's all but you got to have the conversation about risk. Like I don't want you to go be the Coast Guard. I want you to be able to have that conversation with the patient. If they're ready to do the restorative and you're ready and you want to do the restorative on those patients that you think it's appropriate, I don't have any problem with that. What we need to figure out how to do is, is to make sure that we're managing the risk and protecting our restorations and protecting the teeth on the other side of that. And I, I think we have the materials that are designed to do that. Um, I think we just need to create those you know, create those protocols within our practice to be able to successfully accomplish that. And then I think that everybody wins. And essentially the fact of, of you know, the, the, the financial pressures that, that, that everybody is under today. So uh, it represents a departure for me, but I hope that uh, it made sense to you tonight. Um, again, I think we need to stop worrying about prevention. We need to start talking more about how do we protect the things that we've done because we're losing the battle there as well. So I want to thank you. I hope you enjoyed the cases tonight. I hope that you learned something new. And I know, Janelle, that we probably have two or three really great, we, we always end up with two or three really killer questions. So I am yeah, on the edge do. of my, I'm on the edge of my seat. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Kirst. Those are some great cases. Um, we do have, have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I think we'll have time for about three of them. So the, the first question is, um, what is your first step in speaking with a patient who has extreme dental anxiety and extensive restorative needs? You know, that's, um, <laughs> that, that's a very good question. And um, I'm, I'm glad that I did not lose my voice, by the way, going through the, to the webinar tonight. So I, I survived the entire webinar. Um, the first thing that I would do with a patient who has extreme dental anxiety is try and figure out what level their anxiety is by and just literally by asking them you know tell me more about that tell me about what makes you anxious you know is it the drill is it the needle is it the thought is it you know what what primarily is your greatest fear and what things have you done in the past then to manage that uh, did nitrous oxide help did you do a, a combination of an anxiolytic uh, medication along with nitrous oxide do you think that you need to have um, a heavier level of sedation to have the work done? Um, so really kind of exploring, you know, what, where their anxiety is coming from and then what the level of the anxiety is and letting them know that they're in control and we're here, we're to support you. Um, so, you know, tell me how I can help you accomplish that. And then, you know, with the extensive restorative needs, again, trying to understand, helping understand you know, where are we going to go with this? Uh, what do they want to focus on? What do they want to accomplish? And, you know, how can we help manage and make that happen for them? But at the same point in time, I want it to be something that I I feel like we're able to manage the risk for them either before or on the other side of the restorative care so that uh, particularly with high, high anxiety that, you know, that they don't have to have it done again. Like having it done once is, you know, traumatic enough. I def, you know, forget the cost. It's like the trauma of having to have something redone if they have recurrent decay or, or something fail. Um, you know, that's that's hugely impactful on, on those patients. So that's kind of where I start. Just having trying to have a, a warm, heartfelt conversation, exploring where their anxiety is coming from and and things they've tried in the past, and you know, what they think they might need to be able to help control that. Great. That's a great question, by the way. And and you know. <laughs> 
and we don't always win, right? I mean, the patient I showed you tonight who circled you know, the dental fear scale 10 three separate times, um, you know, you can only extend your hand out and you, to help somebody, and they don't always accept your help. So um, I think we always need to be mindful of that. Great question. Thanks, Janelle. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so the second question here, in your experience, how has the meter reading affected the psychology of patients choosing to move forward with restorative treatment? Well, I think, you know, that's a good question as well. And I think, you know, I like, uh, I, I have a high degree of confidence in that reading because I know that it very accurately determines the level of ATP that's on their teeth. Now, what we do with that data, you know, it's like getting a, a Diagnodent score. Um, what what you do with that data depends upon you know their other or overall risk, but I like to have a baseline. Everybody in my practice gets a, a an ATP score once a year, uh, so that we can kind of keep a running baseline on patients. But if they've got a high score, that's a concern to me. I mean, that, they've got a biofilm issue there, and any restorative care they've already had done or that I'm about to do um, certainly places those restorations and those margins at risk. Um, so I use that to help motivate the patient. You know, it's like uh, you've got you've got an issue going on here, and you've got a high score, and you're at risk. And this is something that it's not something that you, if you want to keep your teeth, that I would recommend postponing or putting off or not or kind of letting it go. Um, now, in the case of the patient that doesn't have any disease indicators, like I shared with you tonight uh, earlier. You know, if they, you know, if they're willing to accept whatever risk and they're not really worried about changing anything, like I'm okay with that. You know, I, I'm just okay with it as long as I'm not having to accept that risk because now I have that data point, and I know that uh, you've got a high score. For the patient that has a low score, obviously that's not a motivating factor for them, but it could be. You know, but if they have a low score and they have lesions, um, the lesions themselves and the other um, contributing risk factors are what I would, you know drive the conversation or have the conversation toward so that they understand what other risk factors they have and trying to use those to help motivate the patient. But if they have a high ATP score, um, I, it's, it's a very good tool to help motivate patients to move forward with their care. Great. Thank you. Um, and lastly, we had a really great question <clears throat> come over um, kind of on the orthodontic side. Uh, so the question okay. was, can you address your role before during and after ortho, managing the risk for your orthodontic patients? Oh, man. We should probably do a webinar on that question. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, we should. Um, for, the <laughs> for the love of it all, um, you know, I have a lot of patients in, in orthodontic treatment, and I have two really good orthodontists that, that I'm fortunate to have the opportunity. I work with two guys that come into my, uh, that I've known for since we were in school together, um, and they come in once a week. And so I have a different level of communication with my orthodontist and my patients than most people do. Even then, let me say that it still gets out of hand at times. Um, I think that if I, I know one thing, if I were an orthodontist, I would use the ATP meter and swab on every patient, and I maybe would swab them at least twice a year in my practice to make sure what was going on. The number one challenge that orthodontists have today is, is bracket white spot lesions when they take their brackets off a of patient. That's the number one complaint and problem. And Featherstone did publish two papers that indicated using a 0.05% fluoride rinse, you know, every day would virtually 100% eliminate white spot lesions. You know, if we could identify who those patients were that were going to be at risk better and then, again, manage that risk. See, it's the same issue. The problem they've got is, is if you stop and think about this, it's not really different than the entire conversation that we had tonight. We talked about moving from the therapy first and the restorative care second and maybe a departure to thinking about doing the restorative care first and managing the risk and protecting the teeth second, you know, what orthodontists are really doing is putting those brackets on before they do any caries there or plaque management or therapy. And, you know, they tell the patient to brush and floss and whatever, yada, yada, yada. We all do that. It's a, way, it's a waste of our breath, to be honest with you. 
But what we need to do is, is start managing that risk with the patient ahead of time, inform them of the risk, identify who's going to be at risk, inform them of their risk of having these white spot bracket lesions. If, you know, this is the outcome. If we don't manage this risk, go ahead and do the orthodontic care and protect and manage the risk through the process so that we don't end up on the other side and now we've got the problem and now we have to figure out what to do with it. So it's really they're doing the restorative. If you think about you know, the orthodontic, they're doing the active treatment um, kind of at the same time or ahead of managing the risk. And I, and, I, and I see that most orthodontists do that. They do that. And again, it, it, you know, if you've got, you know, I don't mean to be cynical here, but if you've got the money in your pocket and you want orthodontics, uh, you're going to get brackets put on your teeth that day. Um, Regardless of your risk, now I know there are orthodontists out there that are doing risk assessments, but there aren't enough of them. Um, that's how I would manage it. And in my own practice, any patient that I see, we monitor them closely. So they're getting swabbed once a year in my practice, even when they're in, in brackets. And, uh, and we're helping manage that risk in terms of talking to the patient about, we want you on these products. We want you on the CTX4 gel either the 1100 or the 5000 depending upon what your risk level is and I want you on this you know CTX3 rinse once at least once a day preferably at night before you go to bed so that we're managing that risk cuz I get to see those patients and of course I'm the orthodontist in my practice so I have a better level of communication so literally I don't see a whole lot of um, bracket white spot lesions in my practice cuz we're kind of I think we're more hands-on and we get an opportunity to help the, help the orthodontist you know, through that. So I'm managing the risk while they're in the active treatment. But that's how I do it. And I would tell you that um, it, it's a mystery to me why more orthodontists aren't uh, in the carry-free family. Uh, it's just a mystery to me. Because uh, um, I've, I've met with a number of, of Orthodontists who you know told me that was their number one problem in their clinical practice, and I have a solution for you right here that works, um, and yet they they don't implement it. So it's, I don't know. Anyway, um, again, you can only hold your hand out and offer to help people, and and you know that's all you can do. So that's a great question, by the way, and I and I and I think that it really applies to what we were talking about earlier tonight. You know, whether it's restorative care or orthodontic care. Um, you still have issues on the other side of that, and we still need to talk about managing the risk and protecting the teeth. So whether you're protecting restorations and margins or protecting teeth uh, through that restorative care and, and, and the orthodontic care, uh, that's the same issue in my mind. So uh, those were three great questions, you know, and now I've run us over. <laughs> well, great. Um, and do you have anything else to add before we kind of wrap up the webinar for this evening? No, I think I pretty much laid it all out there tonight. Um, I hope that a little bit of what I said was controversial, and, but I hope that uh, people understand I'm starting to change my process and, and thought about this whole process on camera, and I, I know that other thought leaders are, are starting because we're having these conversations, and um, we need to be able to help move this comfortably into the mainstream for dentists so that they can meet all of their um, needs within their practice and be able to successfully do this and end up with a better treatment outcome for their patients at the end of the day. I am passionate about trying to cure dental caries and if I need to change our protocol to make that happen, I, I'm, I'm open-minded. I'm here. So um, that's it, Janelle. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank I'll you. We, we have question, uh, comments coming in saying that they share your frustration. <laughs> and we want to thank everyone for all your great questions. Um, again, any questions that were answered by Dr. Cooch will be answered via email within the next few days. Um, and we really appreciate your time and thank you for participating. Um, an email will be sent out tomorrow with a link to the recording for anyone that wants to share this webinar with their staff. Um, please feel free to contact us with any questions. And if you want to learn more about implementing Canberra into your practice, we do offer one-on-one -on -one webinars and would be happy to schedule one for your team. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.